So it's something that manifests itself from the deep unknown and pulls you under, like an alligator at a, at a water hole, which is, I'm sure, one of the sources from which we derived that particular kind of mythological representation. Because you can imagine that when we were on the veldt, after living on trees, we had to go down to the damn water holes, and you've, you've watched enough nature programs to know what a Nile crocodile can do to a water buffalo. It's not pretty. And so, to go down to the water, the chaotic water, and the source of all life as well, right, is to risk an encounter with the terrible thing that lurks in the depths. Your own psychological experiences can be enough to radically disrupt and hurt you, but it can be worked out in the real world too, because if you're wandering around naively with your eyes closed and you run into someone who's really psychopathic, they'll take you apart and you'll have no defense against it whatsoever because you're too blind and naive. And if you encounter someone like that and they leave you in the ashes, which they might, it's certainly possible that you'll never recover from it. You just will not be able to handle the aftermath, but also you won't be able to handle the fact that something like that could actually happen. And that's really the nature of, of trauma. You cannot believe that that could actually happen. And that's an encounter, it's almost always, and this has been the case, certainly been my clinical experience. What traumatizes people is malevolence. It's not tragedy, although tragedy can traumatize people if it's severe enough. But generally, no, people can withstand tragedy. They are done in by real malevolence. And so sometimes it's the realization of their own malevolence that does them in. But when that isn't the case, they encounter someone who's out there in the world who's actually operating to hurt them. And so, and if the person is psychopathic enough, and this is actually goes beyond pure psychopathy, because at least the psychopath has the sense to be self-interested. You can go far farther than that, where you're perfectly willing to hurt yourself as long as you hurt the other person at the same time. They, what they want to say is, life means nothing to me. Nothing. But, I'm perfectly willing to make as many people as I possibly can suffer before I demonstrate that. And so that's a step past psychopathy. And if you encounter that in someone, it's or in yourself, that's going to be a deeply unsettling experience. And the idea behind many of these stories is that you cannot figure out what to do about that before you have an encounter like that. And if you think about that properly, that's, that's as horrifying an experience as you can imagine, right? It's precisely that. It's as horrifying an experience as you can imagine. Why in the world the manifestation of what's essentially a representation of a predator, so that's this snake, and, you know, the snake is associated with trees. Well, yes, the reason for that, in all likelihood, is that we dwelt in trees, right? And snakes like trees, and they're around trees, and they can climb trees, and, and the snake was a typical predator on our, on our ancient relatives. But, and so that's fine, so you can see that that representation makes perfect sense. There's predators that lurk in the garden, yes, obviously. If you interact with them, they wake you up. Well, they better wake you up, because if they don't wake you up when you interact with them, then you get eaten. So it's probably just as well to wake up, even though there's painful consequences associated with becoming conscious. And that manifests itself immediately in the, in the story of, 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 of Adam and Eve. But then there's this weird association, it's, it's very undeveloped in the biblical stories that, 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 that are part and parcel of this line of thinking. It was more like a consequence of a cloud of mythological stories that surrounded it. But the reason for that, I think, is, is that imagine that what human beings were trying to puzzle out was the nature of the predator. Okay, so on one level of analysis, the predator is the thing that slinks along the ground and that threatens you. And also it's the thing that's your mortal enemy and that wakes you up. But then, that's one conceptualization of predator, and fair enough, you can identify it and you can take precautionary measures. But a better conceptualization of predator might be, where does it come from? Let's say it's a snake. Well, there's a layer of snakes somewhere. And so if we want to get rid of the snake, we shouldn't be conceptualizing it as a snake. We should be conceptualizing it as one manifestation of a layer of snakes, and what we should do is go down, follow the damn snake wherever it goes, and find its lair, and wipe out all of the snakes. And that's, that's a more abstract representation, right? It's not predator anymore, it's the source of predation. And so if you want to solve the predator problem permanently, you don't kill the snake, you get rid of all the snakes. Okay, so fine, so, and, and people are pretty damn good at that. And that's why you have stories of people like St. Patrick, who chased all the snakes out of Ireland. And all sorts of saints were snake eradication saints. And, well, 
there's a variety of reasons for that but then you might think, okay, well the worst predator is the lair of snakes right? but then you might think, well wait a minute the worst predator isn't the lair of snakes maybe the worst predator is the enemies that come to attack us and those are human enemies and so what we do is we defend ourselves against the human enemies we put walls around our cities, we fortify our our land, and we defend ourselves against the evil that's lurking in other people's hearts and so that's like a higher order snake and then we build these walls around us and what's inside gets larger and larger and larger and then what happens is the snakes start popping up inside the cities because you know, we've pushed all the... we've, we've protected ourselves from all the evil that lurks outside but we've now created a space where that evil can manifest itself inside so, there's criminals inside the city and there's people who want to bring you down and there's malevolence within the city, not only outside so then there's the, the problem of the snake that's closer to you and then there's the ultimate problem, which is the snake that lives in your heart right, and that's each individual's capacity for evil and then that, that was conceptualized as a transcendent spirit right, so that's the spirit of Satan, who's the, who's the adversary of the hero the adversary of the hero and that's why there's an association between the snake in the garden and this, this great series of mythologies about the existence of evil itself it's a consequence of our continued capacity to abstract we started using the predator detection system to detect snakes and maybe you know, predatory cats and maybe birds of prey and all that but that didn't solve the bloody problem because just because you hid from the predatory bird today didn't mean the bloody thing wasn't going to be back tomorrow and tomorrow starts to matter as you get smarter and then once you're on that pathway and you're starting to think about abstractly about the predator the nature of what constitutes the predator starts to become is because you're trying to solve it across all situations simultaneously it starts to become very much more abstract and it ends up being something like a personality like an eternal personality and an eternal personality that has its effect on everyone all the time so, and so it's so interesting to see those ideas because they basically evolved people did not understand those ideas as they produced them right, it was all put forward in, in a massive mythological context in, in a rich, storied context and the stories were as conscious as the information got it was never articulated past the level of story you're alienated from your culture always, why? it's old and dead and corrupt and so that leaves you growing up in chaos uh, what would you call, alienated from your fundamental culture that's the story of adolescence Horus grows up he can see that's what differentiates him from Osiris, that's why he's a falcon he goes and has a fight with Seth and now the difference between Osiris and, and Horus is that Horus does not underestimate Seth he knows exactly what he's up against he goes and has a terrible battle with him trying to get his kingdom back something else that's echoed in the Lion King story and while Horus and, and Osiris, or Seth are fighting, Seth tears out one of his eyes now why? because Seth is the embodiment of destruction and malevolence and no matter how conscious you are if you encounter that, even voluntarily, the probability that it's going to damage your consciousness is extraordinarily high that's why people don't do it so the eyes torn out, but Seth is defeated and Horus banishes him to the nether regions of the kingdom you can't kill him, why? because the malevolent destructive force that threatens states never dies it's always there, you can only remove it temporarily now Horus is king, pharaoh, king, he's got his eye and so you think, well he's going to just pop that back in his head and then he's going to be able to lead he's going to be able to take his place at the uppermost pantheon of, pantheon of gods properly but that isn't what he does he takes his eye and he goes back to the underworld just like Pinocchio going into the depths to rescue Geppetto and down there is the spirit of Osiris who's, who's extant as a kind of half dead ghost and he gives Osiris his eye now Osiris can see so what does that mean? you go down into the chaotic wind threatened by malevolence even to the point of damage to your consciousness you go down into the chaos and you find the dead spirit of your tradition and you give it vision and so 
Provided with vision, Osiris regenerates, and then Osiris and Horus go back up to, to, to the world, linked together and rule jointly. And the Egyptians believed that the Pharaoh, who had an immortal spirit, was the embodiment of the conjunction of Horus and Osiris. And that's what gave him sovereignty. And so you think about how brilliant that is. The Egyptians are trying to puzzle out who should lead. Who should be Pharaoh and what do you have to be if you're going to be Pharaoh in order for things to work? You have to be awake to malevolence and chaos and you have to embody your tradition. And that puts you at the highest pinnacle of the dominant structure. 